Welcome everybody to the final session of the Startup Summit. Um, thank you. <laughs> so I fully realize that we are standing between you and beers, so my goal is to actually make this a lot of fun this afternoon. Um, I'm actually going to draw out of these uh, awesome panelists hopefully some stories that you can't YouTube um, and that they might not actually want ever to be on YouTube. Um, but I do want to try and make this interactive as well. So through the app you can ask questions. Please do ask questions because otherwise I will run out of material. Um, so if you could ask some great questions of our panel, that would be appreciated. Um, a couple of things. So after this, we all go to beers. Please hang on to your lanyards. Um, we are going to the Jubilee Hotel afterwards. Um, I'm definitely keen for a beer. Hang on to your lanyards. That is your method of entry. And apparently, you also get one free beer if you actually scan that in as well. Um, so if you're not going, please give me your lanyard. Um, <laughs> so today, we're here to talk about this journey. So hands up the startups in the room, the founders. Awesome. So well done for hanging around on a Friday. Um, keep your hands up if you want to build a global business. You want to be the CEO of a global business one day. And keep them up if you think that you can learn all the skills necessary to do that by reading a book or doing a course. <laughs> right. <laughs> so how do we learn it? How do we learn all these skills to become like these guys here on the panel? Um, you've heard the story, you know, founders stand on the edge of the cliff, they jump down, they build the plane on the way down. How many of them actually stop and ask, even if I build the plane, can I actually fly it? Do I have my pilot's license? Um, we look up to a lot of CEOs, and I just want to sort of talk about some of the journeys of different founders. Does anyone know who this is? Founder of a very famous technology company out of Silicon Valley. You would all know the company. Um, here's another hint. Young guy, Mark Zuckerberg. So at some point, he went from being like that to then being like this, <laughs> hacking code, building a startup, and at another point, yeah. actually being the CEO of this global business that employs, uh, I think it's 13,000 people now employed by Facebook. Um, what about this guy? Proving that sex doesn't always sell. <laughs> um, but Bill Gates, you know, he started young and at some point he had to transition to the CEO that we see today. So I want to draw out of our panelists today that journey, that that, that experience that founders go through to become a CEO. And I'm going to be leveraging a lot of content out of a book by Ben Horowitz called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Hands up if you've read that book. Any of you that want to be a CEO of a global business, you have to read that book. It'll cover a lot of the topics we're going to talk about today. Um, and I love this quote in particular. So that's enough of me talking. Um, they were actually giving me a bit of crap that I actually had slides. I'm not allowed to because I'm the facilitator. Um, but now we're going to actually get into the discussion. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. So to start with... <coughs> Mark Salby, um, CEO of Blue Sky, publicly listed company. Um, what's interesting about Mark in the context for this discussion is Mark actually came up with the idea for Blue Sky. He pitched it to his wife, convinced her that they should liquidate all their assets and throw it all into this risky new venture. Um, at the time of listing, bank balance, 1700 bucks thereabouts. Um, so an amazing journey from that right through to now, top ASX 300 listed company. As of last night, $2 billion in assets under management. So, fantastic story. Um, Leanne Kemp, hands up if you heard Leanne speak uh, on another panel. Fantastic presentation yesterday. Um, founder of Everledger. She's taken that from a, an idea at a hackathon, I believe, won yeah. the hackathon. So, Bindi, uh, who was here previously, was actually the judge, that, uh, one of the judges for that hackathon where that idea came from. Um, but now growing in one year, 12 months, into three countries, um, growing at a massive rate. Um, and on a major trajectory forward. And finally, Kurt Carstens. Who, who heard Kurt, Kurt talk uh, yesterday at all? Fantastic speech. Hands up if you've heard of SRI. Not many. What about a, a computer mouse? HDTV, Siri, and a number of other inventions that have all come out of SRI. So Kurt was actually the CEO of SRI for 16 years. When he took it on, it was almost at the point of bankruptcy. He turned it around that 16 years and actually revenue tripled three times over. Um, but he made a fantastic comment yesterday, which was SRI was in the business of building multiple billion dollar businesses. That was actually what they did. They spun out billion dollar businesses. So I'm going to draw on that knowledge of how do you actually do that? How do you man up teams? How do you actually put people in to deliver those programs? So that's enough of me ranting. I am going to sit down. Um, I want to sort of kick off this journey, though, with um, you, Leanne, around... <laughs> That initial first step, so we, we, a lot of people go to startups, uh, startup weekends, hackathons, they pitch an idea, they come out of that, and then the next question is, what do you do next? So could you talk about that, you know, that start of that journey that you undertook? 
Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I went to the hackathon not to eat cold pizza and drink flat Coke <laughs> and hang out on beanbags. Um, I went to this hackathon fully knowing and understanding that the CEO and the CDO of Aviva, which is one of the largest insurers in London, was going to be there. And so I was there as a Trojan horse. I wanted to get 10 minutes with those guys in the corner of the room. Um, but if I had to walk across broken glass to do it or come up with a crazy idea around diamonds on the blockchain, well, that's kind of what you had to do. So I was super surprised, um, firstly, that the hackathon um, gave so many tools to enable you to actually build something super rapidly and there was a workable product at the end of that 24 hours. And then after I win, um, what did I do? I actually didn't sleep that night. Um, I, I, uh, I remember um, just continuing to work through the night and then got straight on a train and had to go to a meeting the next morning um, to you know, further uh, run out the idea that I had out of, out of <coughs> Australia. So I guess it, you know, Everledger really caught me by surprise. It wasn't something that was truly planned. It wasn't necessarily a lightning bolt moment. Many people in the room saw the genius in what was done in such a short period of time, um, whereas I, it didn't really occur to me until after the event, um, probably about three or four weeks afterwards when I was approached by the managing director of Techstars Barclays and then, you know, Twitter feeds were lighting up. Uh, there were all sorts of activities. I thought, oh, it was kind of cool. Like, diamonds on the blockchain, sure, it was easy. But for me, I still didn't believe that it was a, it was an, a business idea. I thought it was a hackathon, right? It's cool. I got the attention of the people that I wanted to talk to. Um, and then I, I kind of left it behind me. But So it actually started to morph into a business over time. And it really took me probably three or four months to get to a point where I, I ended up taking myself and what we did seriously. And I was like, wow, OK, there's something here. That's awesome. So I'd, I'd like to continue that conversation around that next part of that journey. But Mark, coming back to the start of your journey, mm -hmm. that, that conversation that you have with your wife to actually go and liquidate everything, to risk everything, <laughs> yep. how, can you walk us through that conversation? What, how does that go? Yeah, well, my, my wife doesn't drink, so there that, that was no sort of easy, easy into that with her. Uh, she's quite fit and she's very, a lot smarter than me. She's very bright um, and very athletic. So got me covered on all bases. But fortunately, actually, it was actually a relatively easy conversation. So I was 35 uh, when I decided to start Blue Sky, which was as Blue Sky Private Equity. And, uh, and so the sort of the larger fund group that we are now is, is a function of a few sliding doors that we can talk to later on and a little bit of luck. And, um, uh, but certainly, we, we'd had it, we had about, um, you know, about $2 million that we'd sort of saved up of assets and got, you know, I worked for a cotton company and got bonuses and saved them up. And, and we, so I sold the house, sold all the shares, put everything into cash. Interestingly, banks don't lend you money when you have cash, which I didn't realise, because <laughs> uh, I thought I could just double that and borrow some more money. But, um, but, but as a matter of principle, so when we started Blue Sky Private Equity, it was really important for us to invest with the people who were asking to invest with us in the new deals that we were finding. And so a lot of my money was going into the funds. And so when I, when I, I said to Heidi, look, I've got a plan. I want to start a private equity company. Um, we're going to have to liquidate all of our assets. We're going to rent again. Uh, we will live near your parents just in case we can't afford to pay the rent. Uh, and then I had a plan, uh, and I did have a plan, and I had a plan to, to use that cash to fund the business early, to invest into those funds, and to, to run down into... And, that, and the plan changed, as it does, and the plan changed. But, but once I, I ended up with this goal, which was to list by December 2011. We listed in January 2012 because of all the things that represented, and also that would allow me to get a salary again. And it is true that... Um, so, so Heidi was very cool, so she would say to me, I said to her, look, I'll be moving money around the funds and the other things that we're doing. Um, and as I do that, like, just check with me each month and I'll make sure there's some money in the account to pay the school fees or whatever else. And this month out from this listing, Heidi does the traditional, say, so Mark, we're right to go this month, I've got the, these fees to pay and everything else. I said, actually, hold off a month. And I remember she's sitting there, she, it's like her eyebrows went up. And then there was silence, and then she just walked off. And that was about the most confrontation that I had the whole time. <laughs> uh, and, for, you know, and, and, and we were right in the middle of, um, of trying to list. And, and, and it, was a, it was actually looking a bit dicey because mm -hmm. we had ASIC. Uh, you can imagine this is at a difficult time as well. But ASIC, mm -hmm. imagine their joy at seeing Blue Sky turn up. So we're in venture capital, hedge funds, <laughs> private equity, uh, property, um, water fund, all these things that were 
every, if they had a warning list, it was, that was the whole lot. Call Blue Sky from Brisbane. It's about the worst. If they had a, but if they had a recipe for their worst possible uh, thing that could come up, that was going to be us. And, uh, and so, in fact, they put a stop order on us and really tried to, really, really tried to stop us from getting listed. And, and, it, and it sort of felt to me, you know, also, that, that they were really... Um, that they were having a bit of fun, and that they thought this was a real joke. And uh, and I remember, I, I don't know if, I've, if you heard this story, but we we were offered two codes. You get a, a three-letter code when you list, and um, and the the two that they gave us were BSA, which is bullshit artist, <laughs> and BLA, which is blah. So blah, we are. That's our <laughs> that's our code. And you could just see them writing this stuff and just having so much fun with it, yeah. thinking these guys are never going to do any good. And and now we're the, in the top five performing stocks in the last five years in the country. And uh, and it, you know it, it, it like it shouldn't, but it does actually feel good to to have, to have done well. And, and now we've got a listed fund, and they really uh, they really like us now. That's awesome. So I want to talk about putting the money in and what sort of impact that had in your decision making. So hands up, so the startups who are risking their own capital, they've, they've taken some of their mm. own money, their life savings, like that's phenomenal actually, that's a big chunk of the people who put up their hand doing a startup. <laughs> How much does, Mark, that, that skin in the game from a founder change oh. the behaviour? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, I, I was taught that, I, I was very lucky, I had a, a guy who was a mentor, uh, his name was Ian McLaughlin, and he's since passed away, and he would, would have been the first chairman of Blue Sky. In fact, I was desperately trying to get listed in time to having be there with me with the listing and um, and he had said you know he was sort of one of those red wine drinking old sort of guys you know you can imagine him on the back of the of the AFR when he had the ridiculous nose and all those things and he was he started Port Adelaide Footy Clubs so I met him in Adelaide and really hard guy and his golden rule was they've got to have money in and I've actually seen that in action not only not only with my own behaviour but with you know Beach Burrito Company which I talked about yesterday with Blake Reed. Uh, when we've given shares to people in Blue Skies we've grown, we've given them to them. Uh, you know, it might be that it's sweat equity or whatever. If they don't pay for it, mm. they don't pay dollars for it, mm. they don't value it. And they treat it differently and it's a lottery. It's a risk-free option, Aaron. And, and you, you've got to have everything. And I always tell the story about Blake with his $52,000 bank balance and we took 50 grand of it and left him with two. And he says he would have shut the door. Right. And now he's going you know, to be quite wealthy and he's also you know, probably our best entrepreneur that we've backed because he's been a lot of fun. And uh, it's an absolute must, which also applies, though, to our investment teams. So whenever we do a deal, so we just did a deal in, um, in uh, the US where we invested in a billboards business for our New York office. And uh, so we're doing digital billboards. And Tim Wilson, the head of private equity, sold some Blue Sky shares because he had no mortgage left to go. He's, you know, and he... And he sold some shares to invest into the billboards because he mm. said, if people are going to invest offshore with me while well, I'm the head of private equity, I've got to be in there for a meaningful number. Yep. You've got to do it. It's a, it's, it's, and you get people fight you the whole way through. And they say, oh, well, I've got... Uh, I'll, I'll tell you another story. So I just, uh, it's a Harvard story. <laughs> it's a Harvard story. So I went and presented it at Harvard Endowment Fund to try and get money. I didn't do a very good job because I got no money. And they asked me this question right at the end. They said, how much of your wealth do you have tied up in Blue Sky or its funds? And I said, well, 100%. They looked at me and then they all started laughing. And they said, 100% really? I said, yeah, people say 13.6 or 24.2 or something, but no one's ever said 100. And they all started laughing and kicked me out. I didn't get any money and I realised it's now. They thought I was an idiot. They thought I was a complete idiot having all, that, all my money tied up in the Blue Sky funds. But I can tell you that it absolutely has kept me very focused on, on Blue Sky's journey. It's something I want to talk about more. So this concept of courage, like the, the confidence to do that, the courage to do that. Um, ben Horowitz, he has this, this quote that a, a great CEO or the ideal CEO is a balance of brilliance and courage. Um, we hear a lot like it's easier than ever to launch a startup and I, I actually have an issue with that. I, I think you still need like balls of steel, like you need a bucket load of courage to be a CEO and battle through the 3 a.m. battles. Do you want to talk, talk about your balls of steel, Kurt? Yeah, I was going to pick on you, Kurt, <laughs> because you've seen a lot of founders. Like, you've, you must have spun up a lot of entrepreneurs to manage these yeah. other businesses. Yeah. How much is courage important? How much is attitude important? You know, I never thought about that. Um, I don't know why. I, um, some of the people yesterday, maybe you did, they, you know, you do this and you don't think of it as being risky. You don't, I don't, I never thought of it as being, taking extraordinary courage. It's about having the right skills. When I went to SRI, it was a hostile environment. Imagine a company that has been in decline for 20 years, one or two percent per year for 20 years, that has used up its bank lines. If it breaks its bank covenants one more year, the company goes bankrupt. And I come from a subsidiary and I become the CEO. And people say, well, Kurt, how could you take that job? 
<laughs> and as you'd imagine, inside the company, everybody hates everybody else because you never blame yourself, you blame the other guy when everything is falling apart. And um, we basically did very simple, basic things, which we said, what's the need? Need vision plan, that's kind of how you get people to change. The need, obviously, is we're going out of business, so that wasn't so hard. Um, what's the vision? The vision we started with is we want to change the world. We are literally going to do things that will change how the world thinks, acts, and works. And then the plan was, my talk the other day, we're going to work differently. We're going to work using best practices, and that will be so much more efficient, so much more effective, that we will be able to do this. Now, you can imagine, nobody believed me in the beginning, right? But I had seen this work before, so I wasn't nervous about it. I wasn't feeling like I was being courageous. I was just doing what comes from a lot of hard experience. If we do this with great people, by the way, SRI now has 2,500 people, so imagine you've got um, 12 or 1,500 PhDs from Harvard, Cambridge, you know, I mean, um, and these guys all think, who is this guy, right? Mm. Um, every CEO had failed up to me, and they knew I was going to fail. They knew it wouldn't work. The only question about me is we know he's bad. We just haven't figured out how yet. So not <laughs> only not only was the, the whole environment inside, um, just about everybody was hostile to me during this process. That was actually the only thing that was upsetting because where I worked before, we became friends. We just had a great session about how important it is to have these personal relationships that are trusted and how you can work together and you go out to eat and mm. you know that whole level of really intense collaboration. And all of a sudden, bam, that was gone. And I had to prove myself to make this happen. But I never felt it was being courageous. I just thought, we, if we do the right things day after day and bit by bit, we had people who stepped up to it and sure enough, we, we, I think as much as any research laboratory in the world, we have changed the world. Yeah, I, I really like the point you're making there. So we have a question from the audience. Please remember, do uh, send through your questions through the app. So the, the question from Jade is around, is it always a good idea to be your own CEO? Leanne, was there a point where you thought, am I the right person to drive this ship? Would that ever <laughs> enter your mind? No, I actually had great confidence. <laughs> because again, I thought I was bringing, it wasn't me, I, it was, I was convinced I was bringing a set of skills and procedures and methodologies that would enable the genius of SRI, not Kirk. Mm. It's not Kirk. It's the genius of the people in the company. I say one other thing about that. Every one of us in this room is motivated by achievement. And we've talked about that a lot. If you want people to work 80 hours a week, they have to work on things that have real meaning. Mm. And if they do, and if you create an environment that supports them, you know, and energizes them, they will do that. And you don't, you could never force people to work that hard. And that was my goal. If we could get people to, to work on these big paradigm shifting problems, and we could get them to collaborate in the way that I described the other day, and have a basic playbook for fundamental concepts that everyone has talked about over the last two days, I was convinced we would be successful. And I'm convinced of that when we, create ventures. So right. we did the same thing. Every year we spin out two or three ventures, and the goal is they have to be at least worth a couple hundred million dollars or it's not worth this to us. So Leanne, re maybe rewind a couple of startups. So you've, you've had a number of successful startups. Mm -hmm. You've exited um, to some corporates and an ASX listed company. But, but go back maybe to your first startup. Was there a moment where you thought this is better off in the hands of somewhere, someone else? Uh, no, not on my first view. I always <laughs> thought... I could do this, and, and yeah. I did successfully. But this one, we're, we're running ourselves straight into a Series A um, in the next six months, and one of the conversations we've had with really large institutional investors, I put straight on the table as a part of our roadmap, is we need to find a really good CEO. And they're like, sorry, Leanne? <laughs> I said, yeah, we need to find a great global CEO that, you know, is tread in a part of these footsteps. You know, I think that I've got the hands uh, on, on a Ferrari that's, you know, humming with an engine that's, you know, supercharged. And so I feel the speed of where we're sitting. And I think to have the maturity to understand where you're good, I'm, I'm great at starting. I'm really good at strategy. I'm awesome also at exiting. You know, I know how to cash out. Um, <laughs> And, you know, the bit in the middle, for me, um, operationally, is a, is a rhythm. It's a hum. And um, 
I, I can, I, I'm, I'm great when it comes to a factor of X. So when you want to apply a factor of X, that's where I step into my own and I'm really great. Um, so I think it's about the maturity uh, of being able to understand when you're good, where you play, where, you're, where your playbook's at. Um, it, it's fantastic. So I, I'm going to get Mark to talk about a, a personal story on the topic of courage. So that, that analogy of courage or brilliance, like the knowledge, the skill versus the attitude. Mark, you, you chose to test yourself by swimming the English, English Channel, like yep. a test of courage. Can, can you, like the story behind that is fantastic. Could you articulate that story uh, for everyone here? Well, it sort, of, it sort of relates a little bit to that, that question around um, the CEO because, because just because you're the first person in the business doesn't make you the right person to, to take it forward. And particularly if you think about our business, so if we'd invested in Leanne's one idea, she's had more than one idea as it turns out, but her one idea, that's her one egg. We're just starting. And from our side, we, we got, we've really worked, re I've worked really hard on our team and having empathy for the investors. Like I, our assumption always is, is that everybody worked really, really hard to earn their money. So we get money from all sorts of people. And because we don't get money and we didn't get money early on from institutions, you know, institutional money, which is, you know, everyone says it's dumb money, which it's not, but they don't, you don't know the person that gave you the money. Mm. We know the people that give us the money. It's a very different experience. And so you constantly have to test whether you're the right person to continue on, whether you had an idea that was the right one early on and you had a bit of luck along the way, uh, and also find ways to continuously improve. I mean, my background, I did ag science. There's a degree I'm from Warren in Western New South Wales. Um, you know, I, I mean, I started a private equity business because no one else would give me a job, Aaron, and, uh, <laughs> in private equity. And I, and I really started it because my passion was I love building businesses. Yep. And my cunning business plan, my Baldrick plan, was to, was to have a business that I could build of my own plus help other people build their businesses. And we don't use debt, we use equity. So it's a, it's a sort of a different game. It's a partnership mentality. I like people, so yep. it works well. So, so you know, I was 42 and I, and I could really feel myself, like the business was getting bigger, we'd been listed, we'd at least started to get some traction, we'd really got some good people. So when you get to a certain size, like you get Elaine Steads or you get Nick Dignams and all these great people that we've got on our, like I, I talked to them about, about our second wave, mm. and they're smarter than me, like I, I'm not very smart, and, uh, uh, but I work hard, and so I, I really felt that I needed to, to, to find a continuous improvement level that wasn't incremental. Mm. And then, of course, the channel and Everest are two of the hardest things, or the two hardest things to do in the world. Mm. And, uh, and I don't like climbing, so, you know, process of elimination, let's have a crack at the channel. But it, it yep. brought with it a, a whole bunch of other things that you could achieve from, oh, that's the, yeah, that's mm. the path. So, there's an interesting story in this, but I'll, I'll come to that in a second. So, it brings with it a whole bunch of interesting um, challenges. And so some, sometimes, you know, people say, well, why would you put the pressure on yourself and all those things? In fact, sometimes it's actually better to make something the biggest grand final it can be, mm. you know, so that you can't miss and you can't fail. And, and so I, I needed to reset. I thought, I, I mean, putting your head underwater, there's no noise. I'm not on Twitter, Facebook or anything. I'm investing people's money for five and ten year periods. I don't want any noise. And so my head was stuck underwater for two years. It was a year of training for the training. And that was six days a week you were training? Yeah, six days a week. For two uh, years? For two years, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not athletic, obviously. I'm actually not a very good swimmer, which is annoying. Um, and, uh, but, but the good thing about the channel is you can be a plotter. So I knew that I would be pushing. You really don't want to go past 12 or 13 hours in the channel with a hypothermia and everything else, and your body starts to shut down. Honestly, you go into a terrible depression, Aaron. It's, a, it's the most horrific thing in the world. And, um, and so if you look at that chart, as you can see there, uh, you can see I kick off from Dover, the tide takes me north. And this is so much like running a business. This is uh, it's uncharted waters. You sort of know what the goal is. Um, I've never been to France. It's overrated, in my view. I, <laughs> um, you know, I, and, and I was cruising. Like, a, I've actually got a documentary on the, on the swim because we raised a bit of money for Starlight. And, and you can see on the first curve there, we were cruising. We were going to hit, um, you know, the other side of the cap. It was going to be one of the beautiful arc days. The sun was out. And as always happens, it all turned to crap. And, and the tide on the, from the North Atlantic sw can swing down the French coast and just rip. And it was just ripping us south. And I mean, I'm, not, I'm swimming in a straight line, but it's such a big body of water that... So, so at about the ten and a half hour mark, which is about where I turn on that little hook there, mm. 
uh, it really starts to get ugly. It's 15, 16 degrees. Um, you know, mentally, I'm in a terrible place. I'm incredibly cold. Uh, but all the things that I'd planned for, Aaron, came to fruition. And this is the same in business. It's the same journey. And I, I had made sure that I spoke to 30 or 40 channel swimmers before I went out, which is what everyone here is doing. You know, talk to people that have done it. Most of them didn't get across first time. They would talk to me the reasons why. There was nutrition. It was that they could see the boat and the pain would end, just get me out of the water. Um, it was having a great team on the boat. Uh, so on the boat, you've got you know, people that are meaningful to you. I had my brother on the boat, who is in Ireland. Uh, so for obvious reasons, he's my brother and he could be there to, to guide me through. I had a great mate from university and I had a great mate from post-university. And at different times, as in a business when you've got your team around you, at different times when things on the journey went wrong, all of them contributed, contributed something to my mental state and to getting me over the line in the end. Mm. Uh, and I remember one in particular, Pete Johnson, who was a guy from Toowoomba who was on the boat. Uh, he was doing all the Twitter and Facebook feeds. And uh, I was, and this happens in your teams, I was losing trust with the team that were taking me across and they were telling me that I was going well, but I could see the coast drifting to my right. I could see the cap coming up and I was freezing cold. I said, everything's all, you're right, you're doing fine. I knew they were lying to me. And then, uh, and Pete walked down to the edge of the boat and I'm swimming away and I'm just getting so depressed. And he just looked at me, and I trust him implicitly, and quietly nodded his head and gave me two thumbs up. And I literally cried into my goggles. It was such a relief. And then, uh, and then for the next three Ks, we had a sprint. And, um, and so we got in and, and got it done. And through the course of the journey, uh, like I've come out of the back of that, I, I'm categorically a different person because one of the really hard things that, I, that is there's a level of insanity that takes you into doing this stuff, and and categorically, I was. Cl I mean, I you know to drive us through the listing and the team and the investing and the GFC and all the horrible things, people stealing from you, all the things that go wrong, people letting you down, Aaron. You know, it's a horrific experience, and you need a level of insanity. And then the business doesn't mm. need the insanity anymore. Mm. It doesn't need it anymore, and either do you. And it becomes a habit. Everything's a sense of urgency. Everything's a crisis. Everything, and so you've got to find a way to separate from that. And I stuck my head underwater to do that. And now I ca I've come back and uh, I'm much more settled. Um, I still get angry. Yep. I want to show a photo of you at the end of that swim. I don't know if it'll come up. Oh, there. Just that level of exhaustion. Like... I I'm still not over it, actually. Yeah. Uh, I keep thinking that I've come out of it. Um, I mean, it can take 12 months or two years or never. I I'd imagine what I'm feeling at the moment is a bit like what when the poor people that have chronic fatigue. Yeah. Uh, you know, they get that terrible. It's a, it's, it's a horrific day. It was 14 and a half hours. Um, and mentally, like I watch the documentary now and, and I still cry watching it. Yeah. Like, it, like the pain, he did such a good bloody job of filming it that it all comes back to me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, but to then share that, you know, with my family and all those things has been great. Um, is it true that you set yourself a goal that if you missed a single training session during that two years that you would actually step down as CEO? So what I did do um, is I said that if I got into the water at the start of the swim, which is you know, at four o'clock in the morning, and I didn't get across because I wasn't 100% prepared, then I would sack myself from Blue Sky, sure. I didn't tell anyone except for my wife, but then yeah. the boat guys, they knew that. Um, and also, so in other words, if I hadn't prepared 100% for something, if you don't prepare for the channel, like you're a moron. So, so I, didn't, I, I didn't miss a session. I, every, every meal was geared towards my getting fat, which I was quite good at, um, <laughs> and, and, and getting ready for, you know, I trained with the same food re regime for my swimming for six months. So I just covered every base. I mean, this job's about risk mitigation. Building a business mm -hmm. is about, like you talked about risk before, Kurt. You know, people don't measure risk well. Risk is working for an investment bank and getting sacked, you know, because of the global financial crisis when you've got 32 years of tenure. Yeah. I'd much rather run my own show and be in charge. So, yeah. so, yes, I did do that. And if I didn't get across because of my lack of preparation, I would sack myself, uh, for sure. I would have definitely sacked myself. Uh, an awesome testament for actually testing yourself. We have another question from the audience, which is um, around your thoughts on the mindset of going global day one. Do you want to talk about the need to go global? I mean, Leanne, you, you were yeah, in the UK, you were in London. I did it day one. Yeah. This was my last startup. <laughs> I'm not going to be doing this when I'm 60, so 
I made a decision that this is a global business day one, that we needed to take some time. And I'm a, a, you know, I'm a, I'm a sole founder, so it's just me, you know, at the three o'clock in the morning. Well, me and the cleaners, actually. So the cleaners know exactly how I have my coffee. Um, but, I, you know, I made a, a very conscious decision that this is my last startup, that this is a global business, um, and that this one's going to count. Did you go to London specifically because that's the best market for your idea? London is the epicenter of financial services. And right now we see a tectonic plate shift in what's going on in, you know, digitization of insurance and finance. And there's no better market to reach globally or trampoline globally out of London. But the business of diamonds is not done in London. It's yeah. done in Africa and India and Tel Aviv and New York and, you know, in Australia. Kurt, what would you be your advice? So you've, you mentioned before, focus on big problems, like big needs. Presumably there's an element that they are global, like that, that there's a, a big demand there. What would be your advice to a startup that's sitting in the audience? Do they go global day one? Well, we're, we were a different kind of organization because, of course, we had very strong technology. We, we almost never failed because of technology. We almost always failed because of the people or what happens in the marketplace or um, the business model failed, one of those reasons. Um, but we did it deliberately. When we started, people said, you know, why do we have to shoot for billion-dollar business, at least a couple hundred million dollars? And the, the reason was um, um, what we see around the world is so many people doing the same thing. They're not sustainable. You may get funded, but they're going to go away. You know, um, it's like in the auto business. There was um, hundreds of auto companies, and eventually they all get bought up and go away. We, we felt we had to do distinguished things where we could really make a mark in the white space with a really compelling beachhead market that we could go after. If we could do that, then we could get the best VCs to work with us. I told you the other day, 70% of VCs in Silicon Valley lose money. Um, Vinod Koshal says that 70% of the VCs in Silicon Valley are dangerous to your health. 5% um, actually know what they're doing. Um, so we, we aspired to work with the top 5%, which we did, but we had to do big companies if we wanted to work with the Sequoias and the other folks who really know what they're doing. Mm. Uh, the second was you can't recruit the talent you need. You want the superstars. Again, remember I said the other day we were in the Olympics, so we were, we were looking for literally trying to put together the best teams of the best people we could. And the third thing was SRI's business model because we weren't owning 100% of these companies. We were doing the seed round, the A round, maybe a B round. Um, and we didn't want to get diluted out, um, so it wouldn't make any difference to us. So our reasons all had to do with our ecosystem and the fact of our business model, but we also realized we could do it. If we did the right things, there are so many billion-dollar opportunities today. I mean, I've never seen more billion-dollar opportunities than today in every market segment. So our goal was to do what I talked about, the process, and we'd incubate uh, maybe 10 or 12 companies at a time, and every year we'd find one or two or three of them and we'd spin it out and we would stick to these fundamental principles. Um, we've heard all the fundamentals at this conference, yep. right? Yep. The trick is sticking to them and really being really demanding about um, do you really have a compelling value proposition that's defensible? Yep. And by the way, if you do all those things, then the chance of going global, which you want to do, mm. right, with an intuitive surgical or a nuance or uh, the other companies we've been spinning out, Yep. Um, it's almost inevitable you're going to do that. Yeah. There's another question from the audience here, which is about how do you actually, w w your suggestions for getting the, the skills and knowledge needed to be a CEO, so, so less about the courage, but more about the practical skills. Uh, I might actually flip the question away too. Have you ever gone into a situation or been in a situation where you actually don't know what you were doing? Or well, you didn't have the requisite knowledge until you were in that moment. I did act science, mate. Yep. Everything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a founder, I've been in that situation where a customer asked for something. I didn't even know what it was. I asked for an IPD slam. And I said yes, and then went and Googled what it was. And it was a pivotal moment in our business. Uh, do you ever come across those moments? And originally, but also now. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, in, we're blockchain. I mean, no one even knows what the hell that thing is. So, <laughs> yeah. um, absolutely, every day we're faced, we're at the absolute forefront, the bleeding edge, uh, the knife edge of this, firstly, technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, something that was largely a concern for me uh, late last year, after putting a million diamonds on the blockchain, and, you know, really sitting at the front of industry, becoming the first real non-financial use case of this technology, Everyone was so excited about a million diamonds, but I sat there and thought, wow, hang on a minute, I need 
10 million diamonds, I need 100 million diamonds, and yet the technology, when you think about the Bitcoin blockchain, won't scale. So all of a sudden, I saw myself as being, you know, a one-trick pony, and all, you know, I could see myself being one of those boy bands that, you know, turned up, did one song, and then and then disappeared. And so I spent, you know, the better part of October thinking, oh crap, I need to now kind of reverse back on myself and then go straight into super nerd mode and work out this whole technology layer. So one thing that not a lot of people know is, even though we've, you know, overnight have shot up uh, globally, we've also had three M&A activities with inside of the startup. So we've invested as well inside of other companies at the same time so that we can start to ensure that we get scale not only with inside of our business development but also yep. a part of the technology stack. So, yeah, yep. we're, uh, every day, I don't know what I'm yeah. doing every day. Can I, can I take a crack at that? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I think Mark said this. One of my goals was always to hire people who are smarter than I am, 100% of the time. Um, and if you gave people the chance to work on big, important problems, you could always do them. It's amazing. It's magical. Um, the other thing is just the realization that most of the smartest people are somewhere else. And if, again, if you put big opportunities in front of them, they'll help you. So when we went to Silicon Valley, we engaged with the top VCs. And we had a, they came over to SRI every six weeks, and they spent the day with us. They had nothing special. They just got to help us incubate this. They were giving because they helped to get one big deal out of us every two years. That's all they had to do to justify the time they spent with us. But who did those people know? When we needed somebody, they knew who to talk to. We needed to recruit somebody, they knew where the CEOs and the great partners are. So that network, again, this notion of continuous learning, um, I would say most of the time I was the junior member on every team. I was the least knowledgeable person. I knew, you know, I Mark like talked that. about that. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know generally what it's supposed to look like, but your job is to get the best people in the world who can actually know, who actually know what they're doing, <laughs> right? Yep. And if it's a big opportunity, you mm. can almost always find those people. Can, can you um, also talk to that, Mark? Because, I mean, country boy, traveling the world, trading cotton, how, how do you... Go from that to the CEO of a publicly listed company and get all the skills you need. Yeah, I mean, look, part of it, you make it up as you go along, there is reality. Um, but so, so, you know, to take, to take a step back from that, which is the, the sort of the cotton trading piece, uh, if, if, you know, we look at a lot of people and they've got beautiful CVs, worked at Morgan Stanley and Credit Suisse and all these nice places, and they've usually been somewhere for two or three years. Uh, if you ask them a question, is where did you take on the job that no one else wanted to do? The answer is almost always never. Uh, the best way to get up the curve is through experiences. Mm -hmm. You've got to surround yourself with smart people, but get up through experiences. Take on all the hard jobs. It may not be great for your career at Morgan Stanley. Mm -hmm. It sure as hell will be great for your career and your life goals. And so, so you know, I got, I got really lucky uh, with a job with a, a Jewish family in Alabama, which is an unusual combination. And, um, and so I was, a, I was a glorified bug checker on the Darling Downs, checking broccoli and cotton, uh, and making chemical recommendations to kill those bugs. It's not a glorious, you know, it's not, it's not a vision of your future that you're really hoping for, Aaron. And, <laughs> and so I was doing a finance degree and trying to find a way out. And this is pre-email, so I sent 100 CVs around the world to every single person that we knew, in the, in, just in the mail. And about six months later, I got a call from this group called Wheel Brothers Cotton in Alabama, who had started in the Civil War as a general store. And they had five or six generations of knowledge, never been caught in any bust, had a family office inside, owned something like 30 Monets and all sorts of crazy things. Uh, they had six generations of investing and trading experience. And, uh, and I was hired to be a trader, uh, but basically, whenever they had a problem anywhere in the world, they would send me to solve that problem. So I went to Nicaragua, Honduras, Mexico, and all these crazy places to solve problems. That's a pretty good background dealing with different cultures across mm -hmm. the same commodities, across different oceans and different problems and having yep. your passport stolen and all this stuff at 24. I mean, I got really lucky. So I was 28, 29. Then they, then they sent me back to Australia at 26 and said, here's $100 million, build the business out. Um, and I had no idea what I was doing. So I did an MBA at UQ, and I did one subject at a time, and I would literally throw out mm -hmm. the ideas that they gave you into this mm -hmm. business and see what I liked. And then you build your own toolkit. 
And so I built a toolkit of sort of my rules, and now I've got all my rules. And then, and I saw what people did in the currency crisis. I saw farmers shifting cotton to get away from the low price contracts and to do the wrong thing. I mean, I just saw, you know, I had Bangladeshi mills just stealing out, not paying for us. I mean, it's all this crazy stuff that you see. Mm. I think it's world experience, and that, that is never bad, whether you're in technology or yes. in investing or whatever it is. You yeah. Just take the hard jobs, especially when you're young, yeah. be the junior person in the group, yes. have a crack at it, and see how you go. And it's, it's surprising. Most, you know, there's lots of very smart people in this room and on this stage, and I'm not one of them. And I can tell you that. Uh, mostly what I see uh, with the people that succeed, they're not necessarily um, incredibly bright. They've got a level of intellect, either EQ or IQ, mm. ideally together, which is unusual. But I'll tell you what they've got is they've got guts and they will stick it out. And, uh, and there's that great Calvin Coolidge quote, who is not a, apparently a very good American president, but he's got a bloody good quote, which is around, you know, that the persistence will, will you know, will out, outperform talent every single time. I yeah. think that's, that's so true. And that's why I love Ben Horowitz's book so much. Yeah. Can I add I, one, one, one piece to this? I think this yeah, is great definitely. advice. Um, I always had a partner. So we had, we, on all of our ventures, mm. we had a rule. There Team had to two. be two people involved. Team of two. Yep. Because um, you really do need not only the intellectual discipline of having a buddy, but you also need the emotional support. So you're not on this journey alone. And when I went to SRI, I knew that the diff most difficult part was going to be the people part, because people were angry and upset all the time. And I teamed up with, it turned out, I didn't quite know it at the time, but it turned out to probably be the best uh, communications person in the world. His name was Bill Wilmont. And he said to me, Kurt, why don't we write a book? You'll never have this experience again. And so every month we'd meet for a weekend, and here I am with arguably the best guy in the world. He wrote the textbook um, that's used all over the world. He's written seven books, uh, just a magical guy. Every, every month we sat there for two days writing this book, but really was a therapeutic session for me about how do I deal with this group that's now acting up. I got an email from one of our people early on which said to me, um, you must think we're really stupid. You think that we're going to fall for all this management de jure bullshit that you're feeding us. How dumb do you think we can be? <laughs> now, people forget that there's a human being at the end of these emails. So I get this, and I go to my buddy Bill, and I said, Bill, what do you think I ought to do? He said, I think he cares about the place, and I think he's scared that something's going to happen to the place. Mm. He said, why don't you go see him? So I said, okay. So I go down into the basement of the physics building. I'm sure no CEO had ever been in this part of the building before. It's in the corner. You know, it's covered with physics stuff. And I walk through the door, and he sees me. And he literally backs up so hard that he slams his chair against the window. And I sit down, and I said, Rich, I think you really care about this place. What are you worried about? Let's talk about that. And we mm. spent the next hour talking to him. And that kind of advice was worth the fortune. Suppose I'd fired him. Everybody in the group would have known I fired him, and they would have held me responsible. Suppose I sent him a nasty email back, and I didn't fire him. He would have used his 150 IQ point to defeat me every day after that, right? <laughs> Several years later, he was convinced that he was one of the primary architects in the turnaround of SRI. Super smart guy. He really did care about the place. But that kind of, you know, having a buddy like that mm. to be able to negotiate those kind of things yep. was worth a fortune. Which touches exactly on this question from Nav around going from that's that first leap from solo founder to, to building a team. And, and the comment you used before was um, hiring the superstars. Leanne, how, how big is your team at the moment? How do you, you know, what do you look for in those first few hires? Um, our team's 15 at the moment, and we are employing on a nearly daily basis. Um, what did we look for? We looked for what the business needed. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of uncertainty early on for the company. We sort of knew where we needed to go and what we needed to traverse. The reality was trying to find the right matching talent that really felt the purpose of Everledger. Um, and so deep down, we we're trying to solve a pretty big problem. And we wanted to be sure that it wasn't just about a skill match, it was about an attitude match. And I think that was um, 
you know, that, that to me, you nearly can't find that. It, it nearly finds you to a certain extent. Yep. So, um, you know, skills can, skills can be learnt and they can yep. be taught, but I don't know that attitude can be. So <laughs> Yeah. Well, I know, Mark, you pride yourself on your recruitment at Blue Sky. Actually, you made a comment to me once that you want your employees for this to be the last job that they ever had. Yeah. And you build it as, if, you know, come and work at Blue Sky, you'll never want another job. I've seen how hard Elaine works. I actually think they're going to die in their job because that's how hard you work and that's why it's their last job. <laughs> it's <But> a worry. <laughs> no, that's a genuine worry. But can you talk about your recruitment process? Because you do some unique things. Yeah, I mean, but you've also got to take the context of what we're trying to solve for. So, so we're, we're very fortunate. If you look at a group like Blackstone or... So all, all of the big leverage buyout private equity firms in the US have changed to being alternative asset managers. And, and it's not like having a fund manager in Australia where you can get $5 billion in and then there's a global crisis and it goes back down to $300 million and suddenly your business blows up. Like, we just keep getting bigger and bigger. So, mm. as an example, Blackstone in 1995 took 10 years to hit a billion dollars. We hit a billion dollars in nine years. And then a year later, we hit $2 billion. And so now, 20 years later, they have got 400 billion. It just keeps growing, and you might have little higher highs and higher lows. So you're solving for people, and they can see that that's possible, right. even in Brisbane. And so you can see that that's possible. So, so with that in mind, I can actually genuinely say to them, because you, know, you can't bullshit to people, you've got to tell the truth. I, if they really want it to be their last job, and not because they die in the job, Aaron, <laughs> um, but, which was... So... Um, <laughs> So, not helpful. I think Elena might even be here. So, uh, so, so, so you don't want people to die on the job. So they've got to, and they've got to earn the right to have an easier life. And it gets easier when you get older anyway. You sort of, you say, oh, I've seen this movie before. Like, I don't stress nearly as much as I used to. And, mm. and so, so, yeah, we do. Um, in the first few years of Blue Sky, our turnover was probably close to 50%. Right. Now, one of the reasons for that is um, if you get a few, couple of senior hires wrong early, then they hire a bunch of morons to work with them yeah. that are just like them. So you end up with this big, big cancer in your business. So I did that a couple of times. Um, yeah. Beautiful CVs, but no brains or guts, and very self-interested, and that's pretty common. Um, also, you're not big enough and good enough to attract the right people. That's right. also a challenge. So for Leanne, Leanne might have done three startups, and it goes, bloody hell, I want to go with Leanne again, because she's a, she's a legend. Well, I was, you know, I, we had no reputation at all. <laughs> we were hopeless and a bit of a joke, really. And, so, so, but then you get lucky, right? So, so, so my first lightning rod, luck person, awesome human being, would die for him, Tim Wilson came in. Yeah. And Timmy's, I always talk about Tim, he's an investment banker, but he's a popular investment banker, which is an oxymoron. And so, and, and he knows everyone. He bought a network. And I never understood the power of networks until Tim came on. The beauty of Tim was two things. Productivity was he was nocturnal, because the bankers all get trained to be nocturnal. Um, I get up early. So our productivity, we were doing a lot more. So I would come in at two or three uh, in the morning, and Tim was finishing up, and he would hand over to me, and I'd just keep driving on. He'd come back in at nine or ten, and we just kept powering. We'd save probably a year or two of our life. And then he hired a guy, Alex McNabb, who's one of the smartest guys from Bain. And Alex was thinking about starting his own private equity firm. And Alex actually had some brains. Tim could drink a lot of beer and knew a lot of people. <laughs> I'd started the business. Alex bought some actual real intellect, which was helpful. And so then Alex was at Bain. He settled in. Then we said to Alex, actually, you're pretty helpful, uh, you're pretty good here. Um, who's the next best person at Baines? He said, well, that's Rob Shand. So I said, where's Rob from? He's from Brisbane. Beauty. Give Rob a call. So then Rob joined. Yeah. And we, Rob joined. He was better than Alex. And so then Rob joined. And so you get this sort of seam that you run down. And we ran yeah. down this seam. And then Rob Shand said to us... Um, uh, there's actually a guy better than me called Lachlan McMurdo, and he is, and so we hired Lachlan McMurdo. <laughs> and then Bain eventually called us, and they were investing with us, and they said, you've got to stop. So we then started trying to hire Bain people once removed, you know, from outside. And, and, uh, and so, so, so then we, we stopped the cancer piece. I'll tell you how we... You can, you can have young kids that, that, that are wrong, and you give them a couple of years, and they go. But the way we stopped the cancer piece was uh, we hired them. So say Leanne came and joined us, and... Uh, we do the remuneration, all that stuff, get it all locked away. She's on board, and then she has coffee with me. Mm. And I sit down over an hour and a half and explain to Leanne that you have the most beautiful CV in the world, you're the most amazing CV. If you fail here, if people call me and tell me that you, you know, say, what was she like, I'll say you were no good. I'm not going to give you a fluffy letter. I'm going to say, actually, you weren't any good. And 70% of the people have said no to the job. Mm. 70%. So I'm asking them... In deep down, do you believe you can really do this? Because you're investing people's money. Like, this is not your money. It's other people's money, which is worse. Yep. 
And so, we, and when we started doing that, we stopped hiring morons. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and and then, of course, everyone gets older. We're ten years old now, and you yeah. naturally get better with that experience. And uh, and I, I walk into our office today, and and and, um, and, and I am genuinely astounded uh, at the quality of individuals. We, we we have to wrap up in a couple of minutes, but. We, we've talked before about why you do that as well. Like you, you want them to have that resilience, so when the hard times hit, yes. yep. that they have that calibration to actually. Persist. Which you do as best you can, because inevitably we'll have a financial downturn. Well, we had that through the financial crisis, and you know you've yeah. got to battle through that. Yes. And I, in my view, human beings have about an eighteen-month cycle. They can say, "Oh, this will all be over in 12, 18 months." Yep. And then and when you get to eighteen months, and it's not over. Yeah. So, so many excuses as to, oh, look, we're shifting to Sydney or we're having babies or whatever. You know, all these reasons and we're sick or whatever it is. And, yep. and so people find ways to leave the business. And, yep. I, and even as much preparation as I'm doing, Aaron, I reckon if we had a five-year downturn, I still think 30 or 40% of our team would be there and that would right. be an awesome result. Yep. So we have to wrap up. There's one question left I'm going to squeeze in from the audience. So if you could answer as succinctly as possible, a word would be ideal. But... Um, Oh, it's actually gone. The, the question was, um, what's the greatest resource that you called upon while you were growing as a CEO? So a, a resource. What's, what's a tool, what's, what's an avenue to, for a founder in the audience that, that they can go away with and use? Birth um, to upskill. <laughs> Learn Champagne. To code. Champagne, <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I think we heard before it was network. It was hiring great people, hiring people smarter than us. Um, I think having a partner. I think yep. having a partner, the right partner, yep. someone who compliments you, who you can talk to, if need be, 24 hours a day, uh, because there always will be rough spots. You will always get in trouble. Um, and if you don't have that person, it gets to be really, really hard. Um, and hopefully the person's a lot smarter than you are. <laughs> awesome. I think, um, fearless courage. Yep. You know, having the ability to yeah. pick up the phone and see if you can get to Google. Like, see if you can get to Google, because, you know, getting to Google is uh, a great resource. And you'd be surprised how many global CEOs or CTOs of companies that have standout brands, even the founders of Uber are accessible. Um, and if that's a part of your roadmap and you need that, um, either to dig deep on, on a resource map, then just pick, pick up the phone or stalk mm. them on LinkedIn. Yep. You'd be really surprised how accessible some of these people are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they are. So I was hoping to get onto a, a whole heap of other topics around luck and whether luck is really luck and these sliding door moments that we have in our life between success um, and more around building teams. We could talk all day on this topic. But I think a couple of key points there was around the courage, about building a network around you that, for support, building the team, the equivalent of crossing the English Channel is building your startup. Think of all the support crew you're going to need around that for the dark times to keep you going. Um, Jumping off the cliff, having the confidence to back yourself. None of these guys actually doubted themselves as a CEO. or well, maybe in their dark times they did, but they actually stuck with it. Um, please give a massive round of applause for our panel for giving up their time. Okay. So we have to leave the stage now. There is a final wrap-up presentation here, and then I believe it's drink o'clock. So thank you very much for having us. Give them a big clap! Don't go away, you guys. Don't go away. Who's had a great two days? Come on, who's had a great two days? Excellent, get on in here if you're outside. Come on in, come on in, don't go anywhere. I want everyone to squash in. So I want you to think back over the last two days. Who's met someone and had a great conversation? Awesome. Who's learned something that they will take away and act on? Awesome. Awesome. Who's heard something that's inspired them? Fantastic. Has this event been worthwhile for you, your team, your business, your community, your family? What do you reckon? Fantastic. I need you. I need you to share the message. Right? I need you. We need you. This economy, this state needs you to do something as a result of what you've heard, what you've believed in, what you've taken away today. Because the more you do, the better off we're all going to be. Who agrees? Yeah. Great. So we're going to do something really crazy. We're going to turn up the lights and we're going to get a photo. Who wants to be in a photo that we can push out onto Twitter and all social media about who's been here? Yeah. Come on, get up, get up, get up, get up. Let's get the lights together. Can we move in a bit, please? 
Right, let's squash in. I've got the awesome Ben, who's going to take a great photo for us. Guys, jump in the middle. I've got the wonderful Minister for Innovation, the Minister for the Startup State right here, who's going to close in a moment. So jump in. I love all you guys over there. Get in, get in. Come on, Paul, get over here. Get in. Squash in, guys. Come on over. Everyone over there, come on in for a photo. Squash in. Get in, get in, quick. You, you better kneel down over there. Come on. <laughs> come on. I should go over there. Come on, off you go. Great. Squash in. Come on, guys. We need some red T-shirts up the front. Quick, quick, quick. Get on some chairs if you're down the back. Safely, safely, right? And what I'd love to see, right, we're going to try and get a couple of photos. Jump in, guys, down the front. Quick, quick, quick. Come on over, right? We're going to get a couple of photos. So, um... Let's start, let's start with a serious photo. Come on, come on, put your serious face on, quick, right? <laughs> let's go, yep. On the count of three, let's say innovation, one, two, three. Innovation. Now on the count of three, let's say startups, one, two, three. Startups. Right, yeah, I want you all smiling, right, come on. Get on over, Brad, quick, get in here. Excellent. It's so important that we share the news, we share the experience with everyone, right? So thanks, Ben, for taking a great photo. We got one more? Okay, I better get in two, right? Okay. Here we go. Let's all smile quick. One, two, three, smile. Cheers. Cheers. Awesome. One more. One more quick. Great, give them a clap. Okay, while you're grabbing your seat, while you're grabbing your seat, I've got a couple of things to share with you. We had a competition for the best tweeting uh, over the last couple of days, and I'd like to thank the guys at Green Socks, wherever they are. They've won the best tweet, so if you're around, please take the time to share, uh, go and collect your prize from the concierge. Number two, we've got drinks this afternoon, and your badge is your ticket to a free beer, Right? So the conversation continues, not for you guys, Coca-Cola only, right? In fact, lemonade, you've been drinking too much Coke already today, right? Uh, so it's, um, it's time to seriously think about, it's time to seriously think about what are you going to do? And, um, you know, as you can imagine, not everyone understands the opportunities around startups and innovation. Not everyone can see the vision and everyone can see the vision. So we need to help share that message. There's a couple of uh, hashtags. Hashtag AQ Summit. Hashtag Advanced Queensland. And hash hashtag Startup State. So if you took something away from these last two days, please share your experience. Let the community know that this was a worthwhile thing. Who would like to do something like this even bigger and better next year? Yeah. Woo! That's a pretty good endorsement. With that... I would love to invite the Minister for Innovation, the Minister for the Startup State. <laughs> Leanne, congratulations uh, on an awesome event. Well you, done. Thank you. Well done, well guys. Done, everyone. Thank you, Wayne. And a big round of applause for Wayne Gerard, who's been an incredible MC today. Such energy right to the very end. Well done, Wayne. Well done to everybody, all the speakers, all the presenters, all the organisers. A great effort today. Um, just incredible. Uh, but, you know, I got a call, a very important call today. It was from Kim Kardashian. And she said to me, I wouldn't lie, I'm a politician, all right, so just believe me. She called me and she said, excuse me, excuse me, AQ Summit, can you stop breaking the internet? And I said, sorry, Kim, but we're going to keep going. So, in fact, what we've had with our social media is a reach of some 18.5 million. So, so those hashtags that Wayne was talking about, 18.5 million reach. That is incredible. We've had something like 5,700 people live streaming over the two days, consuming around 100,000 hours of content. People have been engaged in the conversation that's been happening here. And you have been driving it. You have been all part of it. You've been part of something, I guess. And I heard Leanne say this to me earlier. There's been a tectonic shift in Queensland. And it has happened right here over the last two days. You've been part of it. We've felt it all. And so 
you know, there's a couple of things. I'm not going to hold us up because I know it is uh, drink o'clock and you know, I don't know how startup people are about that. So, uh, But there are a couple of things that I wanted to share with you. Uh, there was a great message this morning when we kicked off from Brad Feld. Um, he said, whether you are a city of 2 million or 100,000, you can build a thriving uh, startup ecosystem. That's a great message for the regions, of which there is huge representation here. And obviously in the live streaming, um, we've seen people right across our state and right about across our country engaged in this. So that's a great message. And of course, if we connect all of that, if we connect them up, they will be so much stronger. So that is a goal uh, for, que for Queensland. And that's something that we'll be able to lead the whole country in. The other thing is that this afternoon, Steve Baxter, uh, he said something that was uh, really uh, got me thinking and it made me think about what I want to pledge. He said, um, the best way to fund your startup is from customers, not investors. So for me, I'm going to pledge today, uh, and this is a bit of a risk, all right, but, you know, I'm getting the energy, <laughs> so I'm good to go. I've been drinking the Kool-Aid at the back. So my pledge to you, and I'm going to read it out so it's absolutely formal, uh, is to work with my cabinet colleagues to be a better, for the, our government to, is to a better customer for startups. So I want to significantly increase the number of contracts that the Queensland government have with startups. So that is my pledge to you. So yeah, all right. And my other pledge is that when I see Kim Kardashian, I'll just tell her, Bad luck, sister. We're going to keep breaking the internet right here in Queensland as part of our innovation movement. And every one of you are our champions, our ambassadors for this, um, for our innovation movement in Queensland, but for Queensland to be the startup state. So thank you so much for all of the time that you've invested over the last two days. Thank you for what you're going to do next. I know that you're going to take uh, what you learned, what you experienced here, that energy that we've all got in the room, and you're going to take it to a whole next level. And we'll just keep breaking the internet from now on in. So thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the evening. And see you next time. See you next year. <laughs>